So um, I'm talking to you guys about bird migration tonight. Um, like Jack said, I'm a student in the School of Environment and Natural Resources at uh, Ohio State. I'm in part of the Terrestrial Wildlife Ecology Lab, so we study all kinds of wildlife. And as Jack also mentioned, the species I study is called the Prothonotary Warbler, is these bright yellow guys. They are super cute. Um, you can come visit them at Hoover Reservoir up north of the city, and they're always, they're always hanging out there. They're pretty easy to find, so, so that's a lot of fun. Um, but I'm going to talk more broadly about migration in general tonight. Here's kind of my plan, um, talking a bit about like what migration is, what species migrate and don't, kind of how that works, where they go, what they do, um, and also how they know where to go, um, how they actually manage to make those journeys, that kind of stuff. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we know that, um, like what kind of experiments have been done in the past, what technology we use now. I have some really fun, uh, fun props to pass around later um, that you guys can use to learn about that. So. That's kind of the plan for tonight. Um, and without further ado, talking about sort of what is migration. Um, birds make a lot of movements. Um, not all of those qualify as migration. What we would think of as migration are these um, seasonal and kind of repeated cyclical movements from one place to another, typically to or from a breeding and wintering location. So if you look at this map here on the left, um, this shows the sort of satellite track path of a bird called the Arctic Tern. It makes like the longest migration of any bird in the world. They breed up here in Greenland. And then the green and the yellow paths show their migration to and from Antarctica, where they spend the winter. And so those red lines on the bottom here, that's what they do in the wintertime. They kind of just cruise around looking for fish and squid and stuff in the winter. That's movement, but it's not really migration. The migration is to and from those breeding and wintering locations up and down the entire, the entire world, basically. So these migrations can be pretty intense, but they're mostly these, these cyclical movements. Um, and an important note of context, which we study a lot in our, in our lab, um, migrations are just one part of what's called the annual cycle of what um, migratory birds do, which is kind of what you can see in this diagram of a year. Um, so the, the migrations link the breeding and the non-breeding seasons to each other. What happens in one season affects the other, and it all creates this cycle that repeats over and over again. And so um, that's part of why migration is an important thing to understand for birds as a whole. Um, not all birds migrate in the same way. So a bird like this blackpool warbler on the left, they make one of the most insane migrations of any bird in the world. They make these long 3,000 mile journeys from Canada where they breed to South America where they spend the winter um, pretty much nonstop. So they'll make that 3,000 mile flight in a few days. It's kind of the energetic equivalent of a person running four minute miles for 80 hours straight. Or if you're more into like the energy use of your car, it's like if your car got 720,000 miles to the gallon um, which would be pretty great right now, I think we would all agree. So these guys can do some really amazing things, and that's one of the most extreme examples of a migration that a bird does. Um, perhaps more familiar is the American robin. Oh, that map is not good. Um, some robins migrate, some robins don't migrate. Um, there's a map here kind of showing where there's parts of their range that robins migrate in, um, and they don't spend the whole year there, but there's other robins in other parts of the world that just spend the entire year there hanging out, including here in Columbus. You can see robins here pretty much any time of year. Um, so there's a lot of variation in terms of species and even populations within a species in terms of how much migration they actually do and how far they go to do it. Um, in terms of sort of what that migration looks like, the, the physicality, the spatial locations of those migrations, typically we think of the importance of a breeding location. So for this bird, bar-tailed godwit also makes a really impressive migratory journey. Their breeding grounds are up here in Alaska on this map that you can't see. Um, and then they migrate all the way down to New Zealand in the fall, and that's a four-day, 11,000-mile journey that they also do completely nonstop, which is really incredible. Um, and so, obviously, those are the two kind of important spatial components of migration, are the breeding and the non-breeding or wintering grounds. Um, some birds on their migration, depending on the species and kind of on their strategy, um, when they're making a migration in one direction or the other, they have these other intermediate locations referred to as staging sites or stopover sites, where they'll stop, rest for a couple of days, refuel, and get ready for the next leg of their journey. And so those are kind of the, the general spatial dimensions of a given bird's migration. Um, because of, oh my God, um, because of the way that, uh, that you know, topography works and terrain works, there's certain common pathways that a lot of birds take migrating on the same continent. So here in central Ohio, we're part of what's called the Mississippi Flyway. That's a lot of birds kind of coming down from Canada through the center of the country um, in between the Rockies and the Appalachians. Um, and then they're, they continue on their way south to Mexico and Central America and South America and then back up in the springtime. Um, and so a lot of those things are, are common places we want to focus our efforts for conservation for birds on migration. Um, as a note about how high they fly, this is also just another cool fact. Most songbirds and other, um, you know, like geese and ducks and, and raptors, 
are flying at like three, 4,000 feet in the air, um, but there are a couple of pretty crazy exceptions. The bar-headed goose being one notable one, they migrate over the Himalayas in Asia, and so they have to hit heights of like 29,000 feet, which is about as high as your standard commercial aircraft. Um, so that's, that's a pretty pretty impressive flight for a bird. There's been some really cool work done about how they do that with like lack of oxygen and the energy to get up that high. Um, and some other species of birds do that, do that as well. So there's a wide range of heights kind of adapted to the path that these birds take. Um, but thinking about how birds actually manage this, it's kind of an impressive thing. Like if someone told you you had to walk to Alaska and then back, it'd probably be kind of a challenge, right? So birds have evolved a lot of really interesting um, <laughs> internal mechanisms for um, orienting and navigating on that journey. Um, one of these we refer to as strictly orientation. It's just sort of an innate sense in the bird of where they have to go. Um, so one of the ways that we study this is with a device called an Emlin funnel named after the guy who invented it. It's like a little funnel and there's a cage on the top and you put a bird inside of it. Um, and birds, when they're, about, when they're getting ready to migrate, they notice how long the days are, like how much sunlight there is in a day. And at certain day lengths, it kind of triggers hormonal changes in their bloodstream and they start getting ready to migrate. And they develop this behavior called Zugenruhe. It's a German word that means migratory restlessness. Um, and so when birds are experiencing the Zugenruhe, they just want to move in the direction they're supposed to migrate in innately. Um, and so when you've trapped a bird in a funnel, it'll still experience that feeling, uh, but it'll just try and move in that direction. And so when you put a little ink pad in the bottom of that funnel, the ink gets on the bird's feet, and you can see you know, where those little foot marks build up and which direction they're trying to migrate in. And so we know from putting birds in these funnels which direct, like they, they understand innately which direction they're trying to move in. And we know part of this is genetically inherited and, and innately controlled instead of learned from their parents. Because if you take birds from one population that migrates to the southwest, and you take other birds from population that migrates to the southeast, and you look at the hybrids between those two populations, so the birds that are parented by both, both birds, their migration path is kind of somewhere in the middle. So they're inheriting a combination of those pathways, and they're flying kind of down the middle of that line. And then these experiments, which are used in these funnels, have also been replicated using actually tracked birds that have tags, and we follow them taking the same intermediate pathways to, to where they migrate. Oops, wrong way. Um, but that's, that's sort of just an, an internal understanding of orientation. Other birds do what's called true navigation, where they actually think about where they want to be going um, and, and make active choices to get there. One of the easiest ways to do this, especially for a daytime migrating birds, most birds migrate at night, but some birds migrate during the day. These guys just look at the landscape and they say, oh, I see you know, these mountain ridges that I know I have to follow. I'll just go that way until I get where I want to go. Um, one example of this from my work in San Francisco Bay Area um, is with raptors. So they're following the coastline of California down. Here's the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Um, and a lot of birds don't like to migrate over water because there's not a lot of kind of updraft things that they can use to make their migration more efficient. And so the shape of the coastline of California and the San Francisco Bay here kind of funnels them all into this point. And so they just kind of headed south using that internal orientation, but following a specific path guided by the landscape. Um, like this red-tailed hawk shown here. Um, but one cool thing about this um, this particular set of geography is there's kind of a choke point here, like basically right at the Golden Gate Bridge, where birds are trying to cross cross the Golden Gate of water here and, and continue their migration southward. And you have these situations where they kind of stack up over the Golden Gate Bridge, and there's just like kettles of hundreds of hawks soaring over the bridge. And it's really, really cool to watch in the morning fog. Um, but those birds are all trying to use that internal sense of, of orientation and their the geographic landmarks to migrate. Um, some birds do some more sophisticated things, including using the stars and the sun to migrate and, and navigate their way. Um, in a cool experiment, using those same funnels, this is kind of what they look like from the outside, they put these birds, called indigo buntings, inside the funnels. Um, and they looked at where they went relative to the, the stars in the sky. And then they took those funnels into a planetarium and they changed the stars in the sky to be the pattern of a different time of year or a different place. And the birds who were looking up at different stars tried to migrate, doing that same migratory restlessness in a different direction. So we know that they're using the stars to kind of cue in on some of these patterns and, and figure out which way to go. Um, there is some evidence, though it's a little bit more complicated, that birds also use the magnetic fields of the Earth to navigate. In some experiments, people have put um, magnets on homing pigeons. You all know homing pigeons, they're pigeons, you let them go and they fly back to where they're from. We haven't known how they've done that for a long time, but part of that has to do with reading the Earth's magnetic field. But if you tape a magnet to a pigeon's face, they have a much harder time actually doing that, um, and they don't navigate as well. And there's some work on these kinds of proteins called cryptochromes, which you can kind of see over here. It's a complex diagram. I don't understand it all. Um, 
but basically when the bird's eyes are open, they take in light. The energy from the light excites parts of the proteins that cause the electrons or whatever to spin in different ways. And that spin is influenced by the Earth's magnetic field, and it causes the protein to change shape. And when that protein changes shape, the birds can see that. And so basically what that means is the birds can, like literally in their eyes, they can see the magnetic field of the Earth and use it like a compass to navigate. Um, but this is still a pretty active area of research. We don't know a lot about how or why this works. Um, and it's one of the things we're still, we're still trying to figure out. And so obviously all those things kind of work together in combination to let birds make these really incredible migratory journeys. And some of them are even redundant where there's like kind of duplicate information being conveyed by different systems. And so in one of the coolest examples of this, I think, um, in one experiment from the 60s, we don't do experiments that are this invasive anymore because it's kind of mean. Um, but these guys took a bunch of white crown sparrows like this and golden crown sparrows. They caught them where they were wintering in California, flew them all the way to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and let them go there. And then the next winter, those birds showed up back in California in the same spot again. And they were like, OK, we'll do it again. And they took six. They took those 22 birds that came back, took them back to a different spot in Maryland, let them go there. And six of the 22 that made the first return showed up in California again the third year after that. Um, so they're using, using some combination of those, of those navigational capacities, probably to find their way back up to the breeding grounds in Alaska and then back south to the, the, the wintering grounds in California. Now, it's not a perfect system. In the follow-up experiment, they took them to Korea, and that did not work. Um, <laughs> they could not make it across the ocean. So this, there's some limits to, this, to this, um, these abilities the birds have. But the fact that a bird could get, if you dropped me in Baton Rouge and told me to walk to San Jose, I couldn't do it. Um, <laughs> So I think, it's, I think it's pretty cool that these birds can, can do stuff like this. Um, and that's just the navigational part. If we also think about sort of how they're actually physiologically preparing their bodies for that journey, there's a lot of changes that birds have to undergo. Um, and so if you look at these graphs, there's a lot of graphs here. I tried to put some boxes on here. You can see in this blue box kind of changes in the body muscle and breast muscle through time. Um, and then these are more of the, the digestive organs. And so these birds called eared grebes were captured on Mono Lake in California where they spend the fall just like stocking up on brine shrimp. Birds preparing to go migrate enter a state called hyperphagia, which means like eating a lot. And they just eat a lot to build these big fat reserves because they burn the fat in flight as energy for their migration. Um, and so you can see in the weeks of staging leading up to the fall migration, which is this first dashed line here in both of these diagrams, um, you can see that the body mass of an ear grebe doubles or even triples. Um, in preparation for that migration. And most of that is accumulating fat that they'll use to, for energy on their migration. Um, and in that pre-migration pre phase when they're building up, um, they're preparing to migrate, they're accumulating a lot more mass in their intestines, their stomach, and the stomach contents. So they're like bulking up their digestive tract basically to, to like just take in a ton of food and get ready to fly. But then when the migration actually hits, their body mass drops way down, the size of all those digestive organs drops way down, and the amount of breast muscle they have, which is the muscle they use to fly, just like the breast muscle on a chicken, that spikes up dramatically. And so they convert all of that energy and all of that mass from other parts of the body, shrink those organs down to half their size, and just dump all that into muscle to power their flight. Um, and so that's a pretty cool, just sort of like, it's wild that they can change their bodies that much in a few weeks to get ready for these, these really incredible journeys. Um, and so we've learned a lot about how birds do this migration. Now I'll talk a little bit about how we know that birds do these things. One of the most important tools that we as ecologists use to understand the movements of birds is a tool called bird banding and bird bands. So if you look in this picture on the left here, you can see that my friend here is holding these metal bands. Um, and there's one on the foot of this prothonotary warbler way back here um, behind my finger where you can't see it. Um, it's basically just an aluminum band that has a nine digit number on it that um, basically becomes the bird's social security number. It's a number associated with the bird for the rest of its life. So if we band a bird here in Ohio and someone catches it five years later in Louisiana or in Texas, they'll know that that bird had to move from Ohio to Texas in that time and how long it's been alive. And so these are really important ways of tracking bird longevity and also, and also movement. Um, of course, that number, especially on a bird as small as a prothonotary warbler, that nine-digit number is pretty hard to read from a distance. So we also use auxiliary markers called color bands, either just colored plastic like on these guys or these colorful ones that have numbers and letters where you can read them from a distance and it's more likely to be noticed that that, that, that band is being observed by someone else. Um, and so these bands in particular were going on baby peregrine falcons in Chicago. And here's these guys sporting their new bling. You can see on this, this baby falcon, for example, he's got his metal band on this leg and then that color band on his left leg. So you can look at the falcon from far away and say, that's you know Falcon 81W. We know he was banned in Chicago in 2019, and now he's here in Ecuador. 
which is a real thing that actually happened with a Falcon from Chicago. So this can this is um, it's not a perfect system. It kind of depends on luck of finding the bands again, but you can get some really cool information about how and where birds are moving to um, in that time. Um, a more precise way of doing this, which I'm going to pass around now, is using these tracking devices. Um, so if you look on the back of this bird here, that bird's got a, uh, a nano tag on it. I'm going to have Jack help me out. So yeah. in the envelope here is one of those radio transmitters. It's a tag that emits a radio signal. Um, you can pass the envelope. Oh, yeah, it's very small. It's, it's really small, so just keep it in the envelope. And you'll just take a look at it. You'll see it has a little harness of string around it to attach it to the bird's legs. And that transmitter emits a radio signal that we would detect with an antenna like this one, which I'm also going to pass around in a minute. Um, and so these antennas pick up the signal. I use them to track whether or not my birds are still on the sites in Ohio and figure out when they're leaving on migration. But you can use them to just kind of figure out where birds are in a habitat or, or what they're doing and relocate them again. Um, so that's obviously a lot more precise than, um, than using just the band and hoping you see the bird again. Um, we, we know where these birds are for as long as the tag is transmitting. But those small radio transmitters, they're really tiny. There's not a lot of battery in that. And so they die after a few months. Um, but we have other technology that fits onto bigger birds. This is a satellite transmitter on a red-tailed hawk. As you can see, it's got a solar panel on the back here. And so that solar panel takes in energy, and it'll transmit locations <laughs> to a GPS satellite and back. And you can, you can tell where this bird is like every five minutes for like two or three years, as long as that tag is active, and as long as the bird is still moving. And so we can obviously gather a lot of information about how and where birds are flying and migrating using this kind of technology. With the biggest ones, you can even add on other sensors like temperature loggers and accelerometers, like how fast is the bird moving? What height is it at? What angle is it diving at? People have put cameras on the backs of golden eagles just to watch how they hunt. Um, it's a really exciting age for using technology to track, to track birds. Um, and this, and, it, and it's, just, it's just getting better, folks. Um, including this uh, technology that I'm kind of involved with. It's called the MODIS. MODIS is Latin for movement. It's not an acronym. Um, the Automated Wildlife Telemetry System. It uses towers like the one in this picture. I swear there's a tower there, I promise. Um, and those towers are using antennas like these. Um, and they detect tags like the one you're passing around. All the tags transmit on the same radio frequency, and they just send a different little pulse that says, this is bird 124. And any, any tower in this network that hits that, that receives that signal will transmit it, and the data will be shared across all the users. And so this is a map I pulled yesterday of all of the active MODIS towers kind of in our area. And you can see there's a bunch here along Lake Erie, and there's some here in central Ohio and southeast Ohio, um, and, and all over Canada where the project is kind of based. And so a bird migrating from Canada um, you know, all the way down to, to South America is hopefully going to pass some of those towers, and we might be able to get a read on their tag when they, when they do that. And so as, as more and more people set up these towers to study bird migration, we have better odds of detecting them using these other kinds of technologies. Though they have some, some trade-offs as well, like battery life and things like that. Um, but we don't need to track birds with trackers themselves. We can also use other less invasive, even less invasive technology to look at what birds do. One example is this thing here on a tree. It's an automated recording device. Um, it's just like a big microphone that you put into the woods and you wait and see what birds you hear. Um, and so a lot of places will put these out on like mountain ridges and they'll listen for birds calling as they migrate overhead and they can get a sense of how many species and how many individuals of each species are migrating over in a given night. And then it gets really cool when they combine that audio information with um, actually weather radar. So you can see in this, this is a weather radar image from I think Green Bay, Wisconsin. And down here is just, you know, your typical weather or whatever. I'm not a weatherman. Um, but if you look up here, <laughs> you can see that kind of ring spreading out in a circle. Um, that's birds leaving a roosting site. So they're all grouped up in some tree. And then um, in the morning, they all take off and fly away. And you can see them on radar because there's so many of them. And they, it's like a big cloud. Um, and so we can use tools like radar and these recording devices and also um, these tracking technologies to figure out you know, how many birds are moving at any given point in time and where they're going, things like that. Um, now, a couple of notes. Our migratory birds in North America are in peril. There's, I forget the exact number, but there's some sadly significant percentage of migratory birds that are in decline and have been since the 70s. Um, but there's a lot of things that you guys can do um, as individuals to, to help make the world a safer place for migratory birds. Some of these are pretty self-explanatory, like um, don't use pesticides, grow native plants. We love native plants to be collective. Um, uh, drinking shade during coffee is one that I like to talk about. Um, if you have cats, keep your cats indoors, please. Um, make your windows safer, especially at night. 
a lot of birds migrating at night, the lights from skyscrapers and things confuse them because they're trying to use things like the stars and the sun to navigate. And so if they see bright lights, they're like, oh, that's where I have to go. But it's not. Um, so especially on heavy migration nights, keep your lights off, especially in big skyscrapers and things. Um, but one that I'm really excited to talk about a little bit here is citizen science, which is just sort of people in the community doing science, um, which we love also at the Bee Collective. Um, there's a couple of great apps people should look into downloading if you don't have them already. Um, so the Merlin Bird ID app, which is from the Cornell, these are all from the Cornell Lab actually. The Merlin Bird ID app, it'll show you what birds are likely to be in your area at a given point in time. You can even put in pictures or audio recordings and it'll say, oh, I think this bird you're showing me a photo of is a prothonotary warbler or a Blackburnian warbler. Um, or it'll do the same thing with audio recording. It's like Shazam for birds. Um, it's, not, it's not perfect. I'm going to put that caveat out there right now. It's not a perfect tool, um, but it can be really helpful for learning migratory birds. Um, and then the same is true for eBird. You can report your local eBird sightings, um, what birds you see, and then that becomes part of a big database that scientists can use to say, here's where birds are and when. Um, and then a lot of those data all kind of get pulled together with the weather radar into like a, basically a bird forecast. Like what's the bird migration going to look like in your area tonight? Um, and so this is a map from last May. You can see in this big yellow swap here, um, there were 600 million birds migrating through the Mississippi Flyway that night. Um, based on how many birds were seen on the radar, what the weather and the wind patterns are looking like. And so using these kinds of predictive tools about migration, you can see how many birds are going to fly over your town, um, even down to the county level these days, how many birds are flying through your area, um, and whether or not you should know to, to be watching out for them and taking care of them. So with that, thank you for your attention, and I'll take your questions about, about birds.